fun to celebrate together the ADR Day in 2021. Now, there have been many online events already today, uh, and we from ADR want to join by sending the love of ADR to all. Our program starts with the universal prayer, after which we will listen to a song by students of the Olcott Memorial Higher Secondary School. They are singing beside the statue of Henry Steele Olcott in front of Adyar Library building. After that, our international president Tim Boyd will introduce us to the day and to our guest speaker, Michael Gomes from New York, who will talk on Adyar as fact and symbol. We are very much looking forward to uh, listen to all these great, great uh, people. But don't miss the end. We will view a three minute quick video about ADR campus of recent years. Now the universal prayer. Oh, hidden life vibrant in every atom. O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O oh, hidden, oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. Hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May each who feels himself as one with thee, know he is therefore one with every other. That he is therefore one with every other. Now we continue to give the word to Tim Boyd, our international president, who has served in this position since 2014. His impact on ADR has been remarkable, bringing to it many necessary improvements that are needed to keep the sacred headquarters in its good shape for service in the world. We know Tim as an open, always kind and cautious person, easy to approach, who brings the spirit of confidence. With his leadership, the functions and teams at ADR can do their best and show that every good deed is worth. Now, please, Tim, our president. Thank you. Maria, and welcome to all of our many, many friends and members, brothers and sisters who are joining us today from around the world, literally. Uh, very good to have you here to celebrate and to remember this occasion, February 17th, in, on this day, February 17th in 1907 at exactly 7.17 a.m. Indian time was when Colonel Alcott took his last breath. Uh, at that time, he was 74 years old and he had served as the Theosophical Society's president and had shepherded, shepherded the society from its 
infancy, literally from his birth in New York in 1875, to the time when it moved to India, to its finding and establishing itself at the current Adyar headquarters in 1882, and on to become a global presence in the world today, in the world of thought, in the world of spirituality today. Uh, prior to the moment at which Colonel Alcott died, recognizing that his end on this earth was nearing, he wrote a letter, very brief, and he addressed that letter to two different audiences. And I'd just like to share that letter with you um, so that you can have some glimpse into his uh, thinking as he was passing. So the first audience he addressed it to was to my beloved brothers in the physical body. I bid you all farewell. In memory of me, carry on the grand work of proclaiming and living the brotherhood of religions. That was the part of the letter that was addressed to us. The second brief part of the letter says to my beloved brethren in the higher plane, I greet and come to you and implore you to help me to impress all men on earth that there is no religion higher than truth and that in the brotherhood of religions lie the peace and the progress of humanity. Those were his parting words written in the letter to these two groups, which he served throughout his life and served quite well to establish this Theosophical Society. From 1907 onward, for almost the next 20 years, this day was celebrated as Olcott Day. And at, 17, at 717 on the morning of this day, the program that we are now attending would have would begin to this very day on the morning of february 17th the children from the alcott school parade to the headquarters carrying a portrait of henry Steele alcott in his memory in 1923 just uh 17 years just a few years after his passing uh, Fritz Kuntz, an American, established the first unofficial uh, Adyar Day. It was uh, his intention that the international headquarters of Adyar be remembered and also be supported on this day. Fritz Kuntz was a remarkable man who, as a very young man, had traveled around the world with C.W. Leadbeater. He went on at the age of 25 to become the principal of the Ananda College founded by Colonel Alcott in what was then called Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. He went from there to live and serve with Annie Besant at Adyar in Australia, at Cretona in the United States. He was an international lecturer, quite a remarkable man. But his view was, and what he stated was that Adyar as Theosophus, Adyar is the mother of us all, and that there should be some special time during each year when we turn our thoughts toward this center that has brought this Theosophical movement into the world. And that was to be this day. In 1926, Annie Besant made this Adyar Day official. Uh, certain aspects of February 17th are uh, quite important. It was, of course, the date on which uh, Colonel Alcott passed from this earth, but it was also the date that uh, C.W. Leadbeater was born. 
February 17th. Further, it was a date that was also important to Annie Besant because it was the date at which Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake in the year 1600. Giordano Bruno was a very early uh, theosophist, an expounder of theosophical principles far ahead of his time, who was burned for the views that he propounded. It was also someone who Annie Besant felt very close to in the sense that she felt that in some way she was a reincarnation of uh, Giordano Bruno. Uh, although in 1926, uh, it was not anticipated, but many years later, Krishnamurti in 1987 also died on February 17th. So there's this compounding of energies of great people associated with this theosophical movement and its association with Adyar. Adyar is a very special place. I mean, for many of us, it is a place on the map. Certainly, it's a physical location. Adyar, we think of as theosophists as the name of the headquarters of the Theosophical Society, but it's also the name of a neighborhood in what is now known as the city, excuse me, <clears throat> the city of Chennai. So it's a physical place. And it's a place that many of you have come to, have traveled to. I, part of my function as the international president is to connect with members around the world. Uh, prior to this pandemic, it involved a great deal of travel to the places where you live and to speak with and to meet with many of you. One of the things that I have found over the years has been that we have many active members in the Theosophical Society around the world, but somehow members who have actually come to and have had the experience of being in Adyar, of being in this place that has was called by Annie Besant, the master's home of experiencing, of living in this energy, even if for a short time. It is something that I find in members around the world that somehow it activates something. That's the experience. So it's a place that many people have found they have physically been able to visit. But beyond that, it is a place in consciousness. Adyar is an energetic point that has been established in bringing into being this theosophical society, really this theosophical movement. And it's a place that for many of us, we have the good fortune to live and to work in Adyar. For others, it's a place that at some point in their life, they have been able to visit. For others, and for the majority of people, you will never be able, circumstances will not permit, that you actually are physically present at Adyar. But on a day such as this, Adyar Day, it is a time when each and every one of us can consciously connect with this vibrant point of energy that has been established by these great ones for the purposes of bringing a different light into this world. So on Adyar Day, we around the world take a moment to remember, take a moment to call to our minds those great ones who stand behind this movement and their purposes in bringing it into being. And in that, we touch Adyar. But in that process also, Adyar touches us. And if we are open, it has its effects. So on this Adyar day, as always, it's a joy, but especially so because this has become a globalized, excuse me, a globalized event. In large measure, 
thanks to the pandemic and thanks to the fact that we are able and realize we are able to link together online. So at this point, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Michael Gomes. Uh, Michael Gomes is a person who in the Theosophical Society is well known. I won't use the overused phrase, he requires no introduction, but he's a man who has traveled the world, the Theosophical world. He's an author of high note, probably the most eminent historian of the Theosophical movement. Anywhere I go in my home where I have a bookshelf, there's something by Michael that is on that bookshelf related to Theosophy. He spent uh, three years living and researching at Adyar, became an intimate part of the life there. He has lectured and shared at theosophical groups, conferences, uh, at university seminars around the world. Author of numerous books, The Awakening, uh, The Dawning of the Theosophical Movement, an anthology of HPB's teachings, uh, esoteric teachings. He's a uh, really been someone who has been quite beneficial to presenting this movement, both in the academic world, as well as to members far and wide. So it's my pleasure to uh, turn the floor over to a co-worker, a friend, and also a fellow New Yorker, Michael Gomes. Thank you, President Boyd, for that introduction. Unfortunately, one of the uh, drawbacks of following Tim Boyd is you find that he has already said or put more succinctly what you were planning to say. But I will try my best. As he mentioned, Adyar Day usually focuses on some personality, some great figure. But I would like to talk about Adyar, of course, as part of the Theosophical Society, Adyar as a living thing. You know, we tend to think of the Theosophical Society as an abstract idea, um, but it is a living thing itself. It is following its own destiny. It is fulfilling its own dharma, so to speak. And it is up to each of us as members how we are helping the Theosophical Society really find its full potential. And of course, Adyar plays a central role. When Colonel Olcott and uh, Madame Blavatsky arrived in Madras in May 1882, they had already been living in India for over three years. They had traveled throughout the country and visited all the main towns I mean, they had seen a lot of India. Uh, the opportunity to make their headquarters on the banks of the Adyar River was an important step for them because it meant a commitment. It meant a commitment that they would be staying in India. Now, at the time, even till 1885, there were about a hundred lodges throughout the subcontinent, while in the rest of the world, there were maybe 10. So you see the logic of uh, choosing an Indian headquarters. And Adyar seemed a perfect location because it was equally divided between Calcutta, which was the uh, headquarters of the British Raj, Bombay, they could go to Sri Lanka, and I'm using the old terms because these are how they knew them. It's hard to imagine how remote a place Adyar was in those days. Even for people coming from the city, it was really a trek. When I first came to Adyar in 1984, there were still older residents, members who told me that it was still really isolated into the 1940s, that there was nothing around the property except perhaps a stall where one could go and get matches. And perhaps this was part of the uh, 
charm for Colonel Olcott and Madame Blavatsky because when they lived in Bombay, the Colonel says that uh, they had a steady stream of visitors from morning to night, people coming to uh, find out about what they were doing, to debate them, or people just curious to see who these two foreigners were who chose to live in an Indian part of the city. So when the opportunity offered itself to acquire uh, the 27 acres on the banks of the Adjar River, they took it. The main building, which is still uh, occupied, was constructed in the 1860s. It, of course, serves as the offices of the president and vice president. But at 1882, at the end of 1882, when Colonel Locott and Madame Blavatsky finally moved in, uh, what is now the president's office was Madame Blavatsky's rooms. Colonel Olcott resided in a smaller building uh, known as the Octagon Bungalow. Uh, one can still see the original uh, property lines by a drainage ditch in the coconut grove. Of course, not everybody found that this rem remoteness was that appealing. Alexander Fullerton, who came from New York to volunteer his service, lasted two weeks. He said that he found the surrounding silence too unnerving. C.W. Uh, Leadbeater, who came here in 1884, describes his daily ritual of breakfast with some cooked wheat they would bring a cow round, milk it, he would have a few bananas, and the same thing would be repeated at the end of the day. And this went on day in and day out. When Annie Besant became president in 1907, uh, the property was still only 27 acres. Olcott said he had been offered a chance to buy adjacent land, but never thought it uh, important. Within four years, Mrs. Besson had increased the grounds to 258 acres. Of course, this was in anticipation of a coming world teacher that had captured the imagination of theosophists. Uh, C.W. Leadbeater, looking clairvoyantly into the future, the distant future, after the event had occurred, said that the society had now owned both sides of the Adyar River so they could have a beautiful view and that the headquarters building had been replaced by what looked like a giant palace within which was a structure that looked like a larger version of the Taj Mahal. You know, sometimes in life, things don't always work out the way we planned. But Adyar is more than just a locality. Colonel Olcott reminds us of this when he says that Adyar is a principle and a symbol as well as a locality. And that the real work of the Theosophical Society functions on the plane of ideas. Those pioneers uh, of theosophy didn't use words lightly. They knew also the meaning of symbols, the potency of symbols. In fact, Madame Blavatsky uh, devotes a third of the secret doctrine of each volume to symbols and how they work. So Adyar as a principle is representative of its administrative function. Adyar as a symbol is the channel between the inner and the outer the source of the movement's vitality and endurance. In fact, the third president, George Arendelle, was fond of this inner and outer, the inner adior he would talk about. We are constantly uh, reacting to symbols, or rather symbols are constantly acting on us, but we are not conscious of it. Working with symbols doesn't require that we think about them, 
but rather that we think them. Symbols are doorways, paths, keys to another dimension of reality. They lead to the real essence of the thing. To consciously work with symbols means that we become conduits like they are for the expansion of consciousness. A, a situation analogous to the idea of Adyar as a symbol can be seen in Tibetan Buddhism where they talk about Shambhala, this fabled kingdom. Of course, they consider that Shambhala not only had a temporal locality, but they also recognized that it existed beyond time and space. It was a place where righteousness reigned, where the Dharma was upheld, and its sacredness was the source of great inspiration. And the same can be thought of as Adyar, where the physical is nourished and maintained by its ideals. One of the ways you know that your interaction with a symbol or symbols has occurred, even if you're not conscious of it, is that you have this experience of uh, santosham or as we would call it in Tamil land, santosham. This beautiful Sanskrit word is usually translated as uh, contentment, satisfaction, but it's not the satisfaction or contentment that comes say from having a good meal. I think uh, the, I've struggled to find the meaning the description of it in English. And I think the closest I can come to is gratitude. And not gratitude because of something, but an understanding that comes from deep experience. When one really participates, one fully recognizes the rightness of things, there's the welling up, there's a flow of this gratitude. Uh, that asks nothing from itself. It is a giving thing. But it's something you are going to have to find your own definition on. Now, some people may be skeptical about this idea as Adyar as a symbol. Uh, but putting this aside, there is no denying that anyone who has been to Adyar has come to India for that's where Adyar is. And anyone who has been to India has come in contact with that larger reality of what India represents. It is a challenge for some people. It takes us out of the ordinary. It takes us out of the familiar. It really throws us back on our own resources. As I've often said, nothing that you read Nothing that you hear, nothing you can taste, prepares you for the magnitude of India. What you make of that experience, of course, is up to you. HBB herself has suggested that one single journey to the Orient in the proper spirit, with the proper intention, will produce better results than years of book study. Uh, before I conclude, I would like to touch on an aspect of Adyar that is known only to a few, and that is Adyar as home, home. Think of what that stands for, for this is what it is to those of us who have lived there. Think of home and all that represents. Adyar is a place that many of us grew up in, matured, became self-aware, that allowed us to become who we are today. Of course, there are many experiences of Adyar as there are people to experience it. The Adyar I knew when I first came there for a year in 1984 barely exists anymore. Certain you know, at that time, Madras was a sleepy backwater of mm, 
only some three or four million people. Certain things have remained constant. Uh, the hot weather, for instance. I remember asking uh, the then president, Rada Bernier, why the founders would have chosen such an inclement place uh, to establish their headquarters. She told me that when she was a girl, she was born there, that it was much more temperate and only with the subsequent uh, this <coughs> uh, deforestation, the city became um, hotter. Uh, those who don't reside there may not be fully aware of how much activity and work goes on there. How people, it gets me choked up talking about this, <coughs> how hard people work, how much they are committed to those ideals. Being there, working there, permeates your entire existence. I would just like to thank all of those people who are there, who are working selflessly and giving their time. Of course, anything I can say would just be a pale reflection of the benediction that comes from those great ones who stand behind the movement. Uh, let me just end with this curious fact. Connected with Adyar are two other centers, Narden in the Netherlands in Europe and the Manor in Australia. They form a triad Every time that I have stayed at the manor in Sydney, I find that in moments of reflection, my consciousness keeps drifting back to Adyar, not the Adyar of location, but the Adyar of inspiration. Colonel Olcott suggests that each of us carry a little bit of Adyar in our hearts. For as members, we are really connected. When you sign that application form, you are making a commitment. Uh, think, imagine the globe as interconnected through its members by filaments of luminosity. You've all seen those pictures uh, with the airline hubs. You know, the airline has a hub here and it connects, it connects. Each of us, when we have moments like Adyar Day, we reconnect with those great principles. Hopefully, Adyar Day will allow us to connect with those ideals and honor those who are no longer with us physically. Perhaps for Adyar Day, we can also use it as a chance to Remember those members, those people who have made lifelong commitments, who have passed away within the preceding year. And this year has certainly been a year where many are uh, struggling, trying. Uh, but we are really at a change, one of those remarkable changes that rarely happens in human history. We keep wanting to go back to the past, but the past is gone. We are building a new future and a new reality that I can be with you today, uh, you in Manaus, wow, uh, that all of you throughout the world, that we can get together and share this. This would be a dream of those ancient theosophists a dream of those members who saw the world as interconnected by the power of thought and feeling and goodwill. 
as Madame Blavatsky reminds us, we are not working that people can just call themselves theosophists. We are working that these ideas leaven society. You know, periodically people say, well, oh, the society, membership, numbers, all of that. Uh, but remember our objects, we are asked to form a nucleus. And what is a nucleus but a very cohesive group, a nucleus of universal brotherhood. And part of uh, it is that our movement has been remarkably successful that within a hundred years, the ideas that were so strange, so radical, so bizarre are now commonplace. Karma, regardless of what language you're speaking, everyone knows karma. Instant karma is gonna get you. It's gonna knock you off your feet. Better recognize your brothers with everyone you meet. I mean, those were key ideas. When Dr. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream that the brotherhood of humanity will become a, a reactuality in our times. They were echoing those great ideals that were started by theosophists. And the society is growing. Each of us must play our part in it. Uh, we can really not be passive spectators. When we study, when we challenge ourselves with those ideas that seem so hard, we are helping on humanity move forward. And this is such a good thing. I think it's a wonderful thing to spend time with you today. Uh, greetings from New York, from Manhattan, where history is happening. I thank you for the opportunity and I thank our President Boyd. I thank Mrs. President Lily Boyd. I thank Maria for setting this up. Even you, Nancy Seacrest. So thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with you today. And happy Adyar Day. Thank you so much for their uh, impacting words and thoughts, and they are not actually not only words. <laughs> there is something behind the words and behind those symbols of tears. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, uh, yes, indeed, <clears throat> we, as you mentioned, we are to remember all those who have worked, given their heart for the work and mm -hmm. without any selfish uh, motive or something, but just because it is the work to be done and uh, going deep into that. So thank you very much for your words and also for Tim's uh, in uh, setting us to this mode of ADR day. Uh, now we will watch the quick video about ADR Quick means only three minutes, but within those three minutes, we go through, we start from the outside, the main gate, then going towards the main Triliton, then headquarters building and its renewed garden, continuing to the completely renovated Blavatsky bungalow. Then we see the banyan tree, of course, and some pictures of Leadbeater Chambers repairs, which will be finished this year. And this is not yet the end of the video. We will visit the Adyar Theosophical uh, Academy, which started in June 2019. And, and uh, then Surendra Narayan archives, which shifted to the library building a year ago and ending to the statue of Henry Steele Olcott. All this in one three minutes. So uh, we just give a, a, a glimpse of various works within the last three years. And this is only a little bit of all which has been done. So let's have the view on ADR.
So here, I hope you enjoyed and had, had a little bit, bit about the current uh, surroundings. So this is the end of our celebration from Adyar with connection to all of you around the globe. Thank you for participating. Thank you once more, Tim and Michael. See you all in the next opportunity. Now we declare the session closed. Stay good, in peace and safe.